One. The old man howled as he carried his dead daughter in his arms. He bellowed his grief, staggering forward, one plodding step after another, burdened by her weight and her death. His daughter was young and slim and beautiful. She had on a long, midnight blue dress that accentuated the paleness of her skin. One of the old man's arms clasped her beneath her knees, the other cradled the back of her neck. Her head lolled a little backward, her tawny hair hanging straight down in a single intricate braid. She had been an impressive woman not too long ago. Honest, valiant, noble. But now she was no more. The old man had been impressive as well. Other men had looked up to him, respected him, did his bidding. He had emanated generosity and wisdom and kindness. Now he was but a shadow of his former self. His fall had been long and swift and hard. I could relate, for though I had never been as high as he, I too had suffered a fall into near nothingness. And I too had lost daughters. His appearance matched his current circumstances. He wore a dirty white shirt and even dirtier loose black pants. His beard was scraggly, his fringe of white hair long and matted. His suffering had chiseled deep new lines on his aged face. His expression was twisted in torment. He shook his head as he stared down at his lifeless daughter, as though struggling to deny what could not be denied. To my left, a young curly-haired woman gasped. Her eyes were riveted to the old man and his anguish, and even in the relative darkness that enshrouded us, I could see the glitter of tears on her cheek. To my right, a portly, middle-aged man was puffing on a cigarette, his gaze equally welded to the old man and his daughter, the air between us filled with acrid smoke. Emitting a low groan, the old man sank to his knees and gently laid down his burden of love and loss. With a trembling hand, he caressed his daughter's cheek. He shook his head once more, swelled his torso with air and let out his deepest howl yet. It echoed around me like a hundred tolling bells proclaiming a funeral. The sound he emitted was familiar to me. Or at least I knew what it was supposed to be. The cry of a man who had lost everything, all that he had, all that he loved, all that he had taken for granted, all that had defined him. It was a worthy approximation, but no more than that. I could appreciate the similarity and the talent that had produced it, but I had heard the real thing too many times to be fooled. The harrowing wail of a man who had truly been stripped of everything had a distinct, soul-rattling edge to it. I doubted it could be reproduced by anyone, no matter how gifted. The old man, seized by a glimmer of hope, begged for a hand mirror with which to test if his daughter still breathed. She did not. His hope was now dead as well. A younger guy, one of a handful who stood in the vicinity of the old man, had given the mirror to him. Now he knelt at his side and attempted to console him. The old man did not recognize him. His mind had room only for his daughter. He cursed those around him. A plague upon you, murderers, traitors all. I might have saved her. Now she's gone forever. Cordelia, Cordelia, stay a little. But Cordelia was already gone, as were the old man's two other daughters, neither of whom had been as noble as Cordelia. And now all that remained of this man who had once been a king was his raw pain, his crushed spirit. A hand suddenly gripped my left forearm, just about where a number was tattooed to my skin. It was the curly-haired woman in the seat beside mine. Her fingers grasped my flesh with a hard, steady power. I did not know her, had never seen her before that night. Looking at her now, I could see only her profile. She was leaning a bit forward in her seat, her body as rigid as a rifle barrel. Her lips were parted in anticipation. Her eyes stared intently, barely blinking at the unfolding scene before us, and I realized she was not aware of where her fingers were placed, 
that her hold on my arm was merely an instinctive extension of her emotional state. And she was not the only one held captive by the drama we were watching. A deep hush had settled upon the audience that surrounded me. Absent were the whispered murmurings and the awkward clearings of the throat that had sounded during the previous acts. Now it felt as though all of the spectators were holding a collective breath, waiting for the end that was drawing near. A minute later, it was upon us. The play was over. The old man was dead, completing his crashing fall. His story was done. His body lay motionless next to his daughter's, his face turned away from us, as though to spare us a final stab of pain. Slowly, a red curtain descended upon the stage. It swallowed the dead and the living that remained to mourn them in an undulating wave of cloth that made me think of a spreading pool of blood. The woman to my left had relinquished her grip on my arm and was now wiping her cheeks with her hands. A few spectators began clapping. Others quickly followed suit. Soon, a steady rhythm was established. The curtain did not remain lowered for more than a minute. Then it was rising again, revealing an empty stage. Onto it, one by one, walked the cast. Each of them lavished the audience with a smile and a theatrical bow before stepping aside to make room for the next cast member. First were those who had played minor roles in the play, and then came those who had acted the major characters, Kent, Regan, Gloucester, Edgar. When the actress who'd played Cordelia stepped on the stage, the clapping intensified. The actress, her face flushed with pleasure, smiled a dazzling smile and pressed her hands to her bosom as if overwhelmed by the applause. In her joy, she looked even more beautiful than during the play. Cordelia, which was the only name I had for her, stepped aside, still beaming. The center of the stage, brightly illuminated by overhead lights, stood empty for a moment. Then came the star of the show. He was still dressed in his dirty clothes, still wearing the makeup and beard of the fallen old monarch, but he no longer acted the part. Gone were the stooped posture, the shuffling step, the tormented expression. The man who now swaggered into the light did so with an easy stride, a straight back and a face that seemed on the verge of splitting open due to the width of his grin. He stood with his hands at his sides, surveying the audience, basking in its adoration, glowing as men do at moments of personal achievement. It was a strange sight. The ancient, frail man, with the grin, stance, and evident vigor of a much younger fellow. The applause grew louder still. Someone shouted, Bravo! People began to rise from their seats. The woman to my left and the man to my right also stood clapping, and I did the same, though not for the same reason. I did so partly so that I would not stand out, and mainly so the people in front of me would not obscure my view. For I was not there to see a play. I was there to see just one man. The actor who had played the English king who had sought to divide his kingdom between his three daughters and had ended up losing all three and his kingdom as well. The man who now stood at center stage, beaming in triumph. Isu Rotner was his name. He had a right to be satisfied with himself. It was a good performance. He had acted well. He had been a convincing king and a persuasive, dispossessed old man. His talent and skill were undeniable. As I stood there with the thunder of applause in my ears, I scrutinized him, attempting to see past the beard, past the makeup, past the smug grin and the blazing dark eyes, and straight into the depths of Issa Rotner's very soul. I was trying to determine whether this man, this actor, had a few years ago played a different role, one for which he had never taken nor was given any credit. I was trying to see whether Issa Rotner was a murderer. 2. Slowly the audience filed out of the theater hall. With my fellow spectators pressing me on all sides, I wedged myself through the door that opened onto the second floor landing and descended the stairs to the lobby. Once there, people began to disperse, and I no longer had the unpleasant sensation of warm bodies crowding me. Some people went straight to the exit, while others clustered about the lobby, chatting. I rummaged in my pocket for my cigarettes, and had gotten them out when a voice called my name. 
The voice was familiar. I recognized it even before I turned and saw its owner's face. The face was freckled, round, and soft. Topping it was a bald scalp fringed with light brown hair. A pair of discerning eyes, also light brown, gazed at me from behind horn-rimmed glasses. Good evening, Adam, Shmuel Birnbaum said. Were you watching the play? Yes, Shmuel, I was. We shook hands. He smiled a small smile. I did not reciprocate. Despite the fact that over two and a half years had passed, I still had not forgiven him for the story he'd written about me in his column in Devar. The story recounted my final battle during the War of Independence, specifically how I had eliminated an Egyptian machine gun position and nearly gotten killed in the process. The story made me out to be a hero, but I did not enjoy the attention it got me. I resented even more the invasion of my privacy, which included Birnbaum sneaking into my hospital room and snapping a picture of me unconscious in my bed. In truth, much of my negative opinion of Birnbaum had dissipated with time. He was a fine journalist and a good writer, and when he gave you his word, you could count on it. The problem was that he was always sniffing for a story, and I did not want him to point his nose in my direction, especially not on this particular evening. I never knew you were a theater aficionado, he said. There's a great deal you don't know about me, Shmuel. A most lamentable fact, one which I aspire to change. You could help me. I still want to know more about what happened to you in Europe and what you did there, both during and after the war. You're very certain I have an interesting story to tell. You may be wrong. I'm never wrong about a story, Adam. I can always tell if there's one looking about, and I've heard rumors about you. Very intriguing rumors. From whom? I never reveal my sources, Adam. Why don't you just print these rumors, they being so intriguing and all? I'm not the sort of journalist who would do such a thing. You should know that about me. I know you'll do anything for a story, even take a picture of a man in his hospital bed. Will that one transgression hang over my head forever? Birnbaum smiled. You misunderstand me, Adam. I don't have many qualms about how I get my stories, but they need to be real stories. Factual, not based solely on rumor, innuendo, or hearsay. I'm glad to know you have a high ethical standard. Joke all you want, but you know for a fact that I do. Which was true. Birnbaum did not print lies if he could help it, nor did he derive pleasure from destroying people on the pages of his newspaper, which other reporters seemed to do for sport. He had also, on one occasion, upon my request, kept my name out of his column. So he was conscientious, as far as his job would allow. I had to give him that. He said, What did you think of the play? It was good. The actors did a fine job, especially the lead. Yes, King Lear is tailor-made for Issa Rotner. He does tragedies very well. Maybe he does, I thought. But did he also create one in real life? You've seen him perform before? I asked. Several times. This theater has been around for a while, you know. I did know, but there was no benefit to him knowing that. Oh? Almost twenty years. I think they opened in 1933, or was it 34? I forget which. They must be doing well to last that long. You would think so, wouldn't you? But if they were, they would have their own exclusive venue and wouldn't have to share this one with the Philharmonic Orchestra. Even tonight, there were more than a few empty seats. Truth is, they've had their share of bad luck over the years, and rumor has it that they're in dire financial straits. More rumors, Shmuel? Yes, Adam, more rumors. But it's impossible to know for sure, especially since these rumors have been circulating for years. You never tried to find out for sure? No, there's nothing interesting about theaters losing money. It's so common it's boring. He looked around him at the lobby and the people milling about in it. He shook his head in wonderment. Shakespeare in Hebrew. Who would have thought such a thing would ever come about, eh? This is certainly a glorious time we Jews are living in. What about Issa Rotner? What do you know about him? I asked, and immediately regretted it when Birnbaum turned his eyes back on me, and I saw an inquisitive glint in them. Why do you ask? I feigned indifference. Just wondering, that's all. I'm curious after having seen him perform. 
Birnbaum's eyes stayed on my face, trying to divine whatever secrets I might be keeping. If only you knew, Shmuel, you'd be salivating all over the floor. He licked his lips, and I could read the uncertainty on his face. He couldn't tell whether I was being truthful or not. This pleased me no end. Perhaps some acting skills had rubbed off on me during the play. Anything in particular you wish to know? He asked. I shook my head, knowing that any show of interest on my part would only inflame his suspicion. Nothing, really. I was just making conversation. Hmm. You're here by yourself, Adam. Yes. Just felt like catching a play. Something like that. You a fan of Shakespeare? I could have said yes, but then I might have been called upon to prove it. This I could not do since I knew next to nothing about the man or his work. So I said, You're barking up the wrong tree, Shmuel. There's no story hiding among the branches. If you say so, Adam, he said, clearly unconvinced. If you say so. I lit a cigarette and offered him one. He took one whiff and shook his head. My wife wouldn't like that stench on my breath. She's here? Yes, and her sister is too, which is why I'm here. She's decided to drop by for a visit. A ten-day-long visit. You don't sound too thrilled about it? Perhaps I would be if I enjoyed listening to two women gossip and chatter about the most inane topics imaginable well into the wee hours of the morning. I swear to God, until a week ago, I never would have believed that two people could talk for an hour about nothing but different styles of dresses, but now I do. I laughed. Maybe you should write a column about it. Maybe I will. Who knows? It might prove very popular with my female readership. He sighed. Anyway, living in a moshav in the Negev, my wife's sister doesn't get much of a chance to visit the theater. So every evening over the past week, we've gone out to one show or another. I like the theater, always have. Early in my career, I even wrote theater reviews. But these days, seeing a play every night just wears me out. Not to mention the cost of the tickets. I gave him a long look, thinking that he might possess information that would aid in my investigation. Birnbaum had lived his whole life in Tel Aviv. He knew a lot of people, and inside that bald head of his was a veritable reservoir of facts and details. And since he had actually written about the theater, he would likely know something about the crime I was investigating. The problem was that were I to ask him about it, even circuitously, his curiosity would be piqued. Birnbaum was no fool. He would know my interest was professional. And while he might be persuaded to share information, he would want something in return. A story. He would want to know why I was investigating this crime and who had hired me to do so. I couldn't tell him. Certainly not now. I decided not to risk it. There was no need to involve him at this time. I had barely begun working on this case, which I had been hired to undertake just a few hours ago. I might be able to learn all I needed without his assistance. I said, if you're so fed up, why don't you stay home and let your wife and sister-in-law go by themselves? My wife wouldn't like that, Adam. I have to be a good host, you see. Give her sister all the respect and attention a visiting dignitary might expect. So I schlep myself along to whatever show they choose. And pay for it, of course. At that moment, a pair of women appeared at Birnbaum's side. You didn't need to be a detective to know who they were. His lips, which had been pulled down in dejection, reversed direction abruptly, tilting upward into a wide, warm smile. He made the introductions. I shook hands with both women. Birnbaum's wife said they were going to have a late dinner at a nearby restaurant and asked me to come along. I knew the place by reputation only. It was on the expensive side. I saw Birnbaum wince at the prospect of even more expenditure and barely managed to refrain from smiling. I begged off, saying I was tired and would be heading home. Outside, they went one way, and I the other. But I did not go home. My work for the night was not yet done.